Councilor Nolan, you do a quorum at this time. Thank you, Deputy Clerk Crane. I want to wait just a couple minutes because unless um, Ms. Peters says that uh, others from CD, the council members mind, just one or two minutes. Yeah, we're expecting a few more from CDD. Right, Zoom lets you know exactly who's on time by to the minute. <laughs> So I, I do think we could start the meeting. I, I know there's a couple other panelists who are will be joining us, um, but I believe it would be nice to get us started. So uh, I will call the Neighborhood and Long-Term Planning Public Facilities Arts and Celebrations Committee. The governor's executive order is it means to the threat to guideline in addition to having been used for public comment. Channel 22 or visit the open meeting portal on the start by in the role to Nolan. President Mayor Allen. Councilor Honorable. Councilors on the van. Is that with five members? Somehow, at all time. Um, around. I uh, want to just introduce the meeting. Um, thank everyone for being here today to discuss life and vision and how we can realize the importance. Area will soon be one of the densest areas of the city if everything continues to grow, population and job opportunities. So it's critically important that we're having this discussion and thinking ahead. There's a lot more to discuss about the future of this area than we can fit into a two hour meeting, but I hope we can cover a broad base today and then continue this discussion in the future. The main questions that I previewed with the staff at CDD and some of the uh, main players that will be talking today to be addressed today include what progress has been made in the alewife area since the Envision was written, what are the plans to ensure the park space and envision and the services necessary for a densely populated area are provided, whether it's school, library, community center, infrastructure? 
How are we ensuring that the Fresh Pond apartments in Jefferson Park are connected to the surrounding green space, job opportunities, and transit? And what are the concrete steps we are taking to get there? In preparing for this hearing, I met with Mike Johnson from uh, Cambridge Housing Authority, who may well be having one of his staff uh, at the meeting. He is uh, unable to join the hearing today, but his, his thoughts will be shared, including uh, the connectivity report that was done for Cambridge Housing Authority by the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority last year, which is publicly available on the CRA website. The importance of connectivity in the area and ensuring that the Fresh Pond Apartments in Jefferson Park, which are currently boxed in by train tracks and a parkway, are centered in this conversation. There's a lot to cover, but I'm excited to be talking about it and look forward to what everyone has to say. The plan for today is we'll go to CDD first. I'm grateful to that staff for making themselves available to present and answer our questions. They'll start us off with a presentation on Envision. Then we will hear from Noah Sawyer, who's Director of Real Estate at Justice Start, who is also on the Zoom right now. And then um, from Mike Nakagawa, who has been involved in, in all of the various groups related to alewife development and uh, Fresh Pond Residence Alliance and Alewife and Vision uh, Alewife Study Group member Doug Brown may be able to join. He just texted me saying he's having a something of a pet crisis emergency, in which case he will send his comments to be read. Then we'll have public comment if there is any, and then open it up for discussion among the counselors. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Assistant City Manager Farouk. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm joined today by Melissa Peters, our Director of Community Planning, um, who also um, was project manager and led the Envision Cambridge process, including the Alewife plan work. Um, also from her team, Drew Kane, who is now the steward of the Envision recommendations and implementation. Uh, and we're also joined by Jeff Roberts, our, our Director of Zoning and Development. Uh, and as you know, um, all, the CDD team has been uh, obviously very central to uh, the Envision planning, pro the Alewife planning process, uh, but also subsequent to that, working with um, the Ordinance Committee and the Council on, um, on implementation and also on looking at uh, evaluating zoning that has come forward subsequently, uh, for example, with the Cabot Cabot and Forbes petition that was um, that was impacting a large section of the quadrangle area, which is the area with perhaps the largest amount of remaining development potential uh, in this district. And I see that we are also joined by um, former city assessor Bob Reardon, who is a consultant to the city and was um, very involved in the in the work related to the CCF petition. So he might have more to add as well. Uh, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Peters, who can set the stage by reminding us it's been a couple of years since we wrapped up the in Envision Alewife planning process. So she can just remind us of what that was all about, the vision, um, and also some of the recommendations. So, Melissa. Thanks, Aram. And through you, Madam Chair, um, I will go ahead and share my screen. with me. I have too many screens. Um, okay, is, is that um, visible to all at full screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, so, so as Aram mentioned, I'll give a brief overview of the ALI district plan, um, um, including um, background on the process and existing conditions really to set the frame for the foundation for the plan's uh, vision and recommendations. Um, I'll then go through the key goals um, and, and recommendations of the plan. Um, so just to um, remind folks, we had a significant public engagement component to this plan. We um, 
had over uh, 16 alewife working group members, uh, some of which, um, including Doug and Mike, are on the call today. Uh, we presented at several city committee and neighborhood groups, had four public meetings, um, presented to the planning board and council, um, as well as had um, um, engagement with our community engagement team to reach more hard to reach communities. We had focus groups um, at Fresh Pond Apartments, had street team events, and, and really tried to meet people where they were in the area to understand their, their needs and desires um, for the future of this district. Um, so the, the planning, um, the impetus for the plan came out of a desire to um, recent development that was happening, um, particularly in the quad, um, as this area was, was changing from um, a commercial industrial district to more residential after the 2005 rezoning for the area. Um, and certainly there was um, concern about um, the, the form that that development was taking place as well as the, the traffic impacts and really doing an assessment of what it is we hope to see there in the future. Um, a particular um, concern was uh, in the quad and uh, the, the undesirable public realm, um, the lack of pedestrian infrastructure, disconnected street pattern, um, the, the, you know, pavement um, and impervious surfaces, as well as on um, the new development, um, some side yards that kind of resulted in uh, unusable uh, public and open space um, with minimal um, environmental benefits. Um, certainly um, traffic, uh, don't, don't need to say more there. Um, well observed um, traffic at, at, at key peak hours. Um, and then the, um, the recognition with the city's um, vulnerability um, climate vulnerability analysis that this area is subject to significant uh, stormwater and precipitation flooding as well as heat impacts, uh, largely due to the existing built environment. So we, uh, as part of the, the public process, we, we looked at alternative futures and Kind of describe different land use scenarios and what those impacts would have on uh, both the built form, um, jobs, job growth, um, housing, tax base, environmental and traffic impacts. Um, and so we looked um, at kind of re, um, you know, looking at different land uses. Um, one, the current um, land mix, but kind of tweaking it for improved um, public realm amenities, um, but then also looking at a more um, commercial and then a more industrial and a residential uh, component to kind of see the differences and the impacts. And what we, we learned, uh, heard loud and clear was this desire for um, retaining the legacy businesses in the area that um, the alewife kind of serves as um, a diverse job center that currently um, holds uh, unique businesses that have been um, replaced other parts of the city and kind of just um, maintain a counterpoint to Kendall Square. Can we offer um, good paying low barrier to entry jobs in this part of the city? Um, so looking at light industry was um, um, a primary driver for the plan's recommendations. Um, light industrial, um, unlike retail, um, pays well with minimal educational requirements. Um, so you can see the, the four services, um, the light industrial um, areas of opportunity that our economic development folks felt um, are growing in both Cambridge and the state, our food, beverage, medical, and fabricated metal. Um, and those um, pay significantly more than retail or food services um, without significant um, job training requirements. So the vision for the plan was um, to create a sustainable, resilient mixed-use district 
of focusing on connections and open space and public relief improvements um, and really creating um, a place where the community can come together um, and build social ties. So the key goals for the plan was uh, to continue its development as a mixed use district, integrate it with the rest of the Alewife area um, and, and really center economic opportunity um, um, as, a, as a driver in this plan um, while also balancing the challenge with um, creating a, a desirable public realm that uh, mitigates um, impacts from uh, climate change uh, vulnerabilities. And so most of the work was focused on the quadrangle. Um, and so it's, um, as you can see in this land use drawing, is a, a mix of uses. Um, um, the area that we spend a lot of time with on um, the zoning, the resident-led zoning petition um, in the Northwest Quadrangle is primarily um, light industrial while maintaining residential as you get to Cambridge Highlands, as well as maintaining um, those lower height uh, limits. Um, the sh um, shopping center um, we envision as this walkable um, 21st century shopping destination with, um, with residential on the top floors, um, screen parking and really creating um, a, a pedestrian feel, um, but community there. Uh, Fresh Pond Parkway uh, developing as, as residential with some um, mixed use um, along the parkway and then Whittemore Ave um, uh, focusing on how we can improve and incentivize open space improvements through um, providing additional density um, for, for residential and some commercial development. Um, and then certainly the triangle, uh, while not the major focus of the plan, we did look at um, since most of the, air, uh, the sites are recently developed, we did focus on how to uh, create more active ground floors and improve the streetscape. So how does the new plan compare with the 2005 Concord AOI plan? Um, it's, uh, they still um, have a mixed use district. The, the big difference being that there's less residential um, in the new plan because obviously we are prioritizing light industrial and to um, achieve that light industrial, we need to incentivize that space by allowing additional commercial development. So some key zoning changes. Um, we um, increased the height in the light industrial zone in the quadrangle here um, to uh, allow for more commercial space to subsidize the ground floor light industrial. Um, we envisioned um, the quadrangle residential area to be the um, primary to be residential, um, especially as it. Um, is it abuts uh, the neighborhood and, and the school? Um, the, um, we allow for um, higher ground floor elevations. Um, so starting at um, the um, four feet elevation to um, protect um, from future flooding. And then we looked at um, allowing greater use of uh, TDR and density bonuses to incentivize uh, infrastructure improvements in public space, including um, the bike pad bridge connecting the quad to the triangle. So for, for the light industrial concept to work, um, we did um, an economic development analysis to understand the types of businesses uh, that are growing in this area that would be a, um, a, attracted to Cambridge if they could afford uh, the lower um, base, the lower rent space. Um, and to do that, we needed to increase um, the uh, height limitations in this area to subsidize the ground floor light industrial. Um, so this went from 70 feet to 85 feet in the quad. Um, and we wanted to allow on key streets where, where we're pri um, prioritizing um, kind of an active streetscape um, that there could be 
uh, retail showroom component for, for many of these light industrial businesses. So when we, when we say light uh, ind industry, we um, defined it broadly to um, certainly focus on light industrial, which is production of small uh, consumer goods like food and beverage, furniture, um, medical equipment. Um, these are compatible with the mix of uses, um, but also um, we took one step further to say these types of spaces that require uh, larger floor plates and higher ceilings, these are all the other types of businesses that we're trying to um, keep and preserve in this area, um, as well as attract, um, are these community focused businesses that require this space. So if we could other amenities um, that kind of provide a place for social connection. So these are things like um, uh, Central Rock Gym and other recreational centers. Uh, we kept um, in the plan um, the incentives, as I said, for, for new streets, um, the pet and bike connection, um, and also a three acre linear open space in the quadrangle as shown on this um, image. Um, and then, as I alluded to, the, the biggest challenge in this area was how can we create a pedestrian friendly public realm with the need to protect from future flooding? So how can we um, balance um, flood mitigation with the goals for walkability? Um, so in working with uh, Department of Public Works, um, the climate um, resiliency uh, team, um, we um, determined that um, their, their recommendations was to protect, uh, to build to and protect to the 2070 10-year flood. Um, and for the majority of sites in the quadrangle, that's elevating to four feet. Um, and then any additional flood protection could happen um, in other ways. And then to recover from 2070 100 year flood. Um, and this four feet um, we thought was um, workable in that it could still allow for um, an, uh, an elevated sidewalk that could um, expand the amount of, of public space in the area. So here are um, some examples of the ele uh, elevated walkways. And uh, specifically, um, we created um, cross sections for street types in the area um, and focused our elevated walkways on Fawcett Street, uh, Smith Place, um, and Wilson Road. Um, and the idea being that um, any curb cuts or driveway access would happen um, on the other roads um, where feasible. Just additional diagrams on those uh, cross sections um, if folks are interested. Um, and this has been critical, um, um, even though zoning is not adopted in this area, we've been using these as reference with developers to um, incorporate these street cross sections into their uh, projects so that um, we can create that continuous uh, street wall and, and public space. Um, additional slides on kind of the importance of uh, public realm um, and the urban form changes for this area. Um, we, um, wanted to restrict, one of the comments we heard in public process is the, the long monotonous facades and how we can break those up with courtyards and forecourts to create more public space, how we can congregate open space um, um, together in the back um, of parcels so that it's uh, more functional and usable, um, uh, to create the, these build to lines to frame the streetscape and really create um, an active um, pedestrian realm. Um, here are some diagrams on the kind of existing street pattern, how we could break that up into a more finer grain network, um, and then ultimately look at it from a, uh, a civic um, open space network of connected 
um, spaces. This again is just showing the importance of framing and articulating public space and how you can create um, a built edge um, that has some exceptional landmark elements that kind of enrich and engage public life. Um, and I'll, on this slide, I'll just point out the um, recommendations for incorporating canopies, awnings, um, shading both from um, additional tree canopy as well as um, architectural canopies to create a more uh, vibrant and, and livable public realm, um, and also um, focusing on how we can connect both the interior of uh, space to the outside and kind of creating, creating that place for public life. So we worked um, with Eric Thorkelson, our, our senior urban designer, to help with the design guidelines for, for this area. Um, for heat protection and resilience, we increased the open space requirement to 20%. Uh, we retained the minimum permeable area at 25%. Um, um, we obviously, we had suggested requiring green or white roofs, um, requiring high albedo roofs with parking decks, pavements, and other services, um, street tree planting every 20 to 30 feet, um, and so forth. Um, one of the big conversations had to do with, um, by allowing this much development in this area, what are the impacts on traffic, particularly as um, it all leads out to Concord Ave. And um, what we did is um, a planning tool called Critical Sums Analysis that looks at different development scenarios and how um, intersections are impacted. So we took the um, square foot by land use, determined um, um, how many person trips that would uh, create and then what that mode shit would be of how, uh, how they would get to the area or leave the area. Um, and then ultimately determined what the car trips would be. We then calculated um, what the conflicts would be at intersections. Um, so based on um, traffic flows, how, um, um, you know, if two cars are going um, straight, there's no conflict, but as soon as someone makes a left turn, that's where um, intersections get clogged. And so our consultant looked at that to understand where um, the um, challenges are. And with the proposed land use mix, um, it was determined that if we didn't do um, any um, policy or infrastructure changes for transportation, um, three new intersections would exceed the critical sums threshold. Um, one at Blanchard, Fossa, and then the Sozio Rotary. Um, and we did that by assuming um, the current um, um, mode share split. So what we needed, what, then we had our consultant run, what would the mode share split need to be in order to prevent those intersections from exceeding the threshold. And so that um, is less than 40% for, for the area. Um, and to do that, we needed to eliminate minimum parking ratios, um, except for residential, which we kept at um, 0.25 uh, to 0.75 per dwelling unit, um, establishing low maximum parking ratios for the other uses. Um, requiring all new development to have a mode share target um, so that we didn't exceed that district average, and then requiring new commercial building owners to provide enhanced transportation demand management. Um, and most significant of, of those tools is charging market rate parking to end users. Um, um, and it, it goes without saying that in, in order to encourage folks to to move from the car to more sustainable modes, um, the access to the AOIT with um, the bike pedestrian bridge is critically important. Also improving bus service and shuttles, um, additional plan streets um, and multi-use paths, um, as well as a um, recommendation to charge commercial development uh, $5 a square foot to a transportation improvement fund specifically for the AOY district. 
So in summary, um, the plan, uh, um, you know, create, you know, builds upon the 2005 plan by creating this mixed use district that prioritizes economic growth and economic opportunity um, for low barrier to entry jobs while balancing the needs for um, creating a resilient um, district that um, has a positive public realm and uh, public life experience. So with that, I will stop sharing and certainly open to questions and um, comments. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Uh, Assistant City Manager Farouk, is that from CDD? That was pretty comprehensive. Just want to make sure before we move on. Yes, that's it, Chair, for us. Um, we're available to answer questions when the time is right. Thank you. I think what we should do since the, the next uh, few presentations will be shorter, let's quickly go through those before we um, open it up because I know this group will have lots of questions. There's already many, many. Um, and to remind people, while the focus of uh, Ms. Peters' presentation was mostly on the quad, Alewife and Vision encompasses you know, the, the, the entire Alewife area, kind of where there used to be wetlands. Um, so next, if uh, Noah Sawyer, if you wanted to talk for a few minutes. So thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Councillor Nolan, uh, Mayor Siddiqui, Vice Mayor Mallon, and members of the council. Uh, you appreciate your time today. So uh, I'm, I'm here representing Just to Start, and I'm going to talk uh, with a, a few hats. Um, you know, first, you know, as a, as a developer and implementer, you know, we uh, are applying the recommendations of Envision Alewife to two sites in, in the Alewife area, our um, Ringe Commons and 52 New Street process. And, you know, think that the, you want to first say that the, the plan has been great to work with. You know, it provides a, a great template for us to consider as we develop site-specific approaches uh, and have found that it is a, is a good, is good guidance to, to help us as we attempted to build, uh, add units and add affordable housing uh, to, to this district along with, with services as well. Um, one piece I do want to sort of point out is that the Envision Alewife study area uh, doesn't actually include some of the, the land that Justice Art, that Justice Art owns. So uh, I appreciate that CDD did uh, do outreach to uh, the towers, the Fresh Pond Towers and 402 as part of the planning process, but that the Ringe Tower area and Jefferson Park were not included in the Alewife study. And so uh, what I'd recommend is that, you know, as we think about Alewife holistically, and we think about uh, approaches to what I think is a very good plan that um, will, uh, with specific recommendations that might affect this area, would be to find ways to uh, engage uh, more closely with those residents and those communities as this move, moves forward. Because I, I, I don't I don't know and can't speak for them about how uh, how much they they how much they they are included in this process and understand. Uh, those pieces, uh, you know, and I want to talk a little bit as as an owner, as you know, Just to Start uh, owns and manages and just steward to the 402 Ringe uh, community, and was talking with our managers and site team about some of the questions that were raised here, particularly around uh, access and accessibility. And you know, it's uh, one thing that was sort of consistent from everyone who uh, you know lives and works with the communities at 402 uh, is that the residents rely on uh, you know, pedestrian and, and bicycle access a lot already. That um, not only do they use, uh, they, they walk to many of the services in the area, but that, you know, walking and biking is a key form of recreation and social activity for a lot of our residents. So anything that improves safe pedestrian access, provides safe pedestrian routes for walking, uh, I certainly know that, that our walking club would be very appreciative of anything gets added there. Um, at the same time, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, our, our residents value the the privacy and security that comes with being in the towers, and I think that that's something that has to be balanced. So, if there is if there is any discussion about trying to split up these sites or think about ways to add accessibility through them, that it really does need to balance this concern about safety and privacy with the concerns around access. And so, I think those those two pieces really do um, go together. You know, one uh, you know. As part of this, you know, we, we do appreciate the, 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 the big thinking around connecting the our our the north side of, of the tracks with the rest of the Alewife uh, area. And you know, I think that there might be some creative solutions that 
uh, won't necessarily have a huge effect on, on, on housing and other development plans in the area. Um, one piece I just would like to add to the council's agenda is really to, along with sort of big thinking about creative options, is really maybe some creative thinking about how the existing resources might be better used. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about this being located right next to Alewife Parkway, but the existing bridge and overpass um, are, is not especially inviting or welcoming to our residents. Uh, right, you know, right now, they, their complaints about having to walk over it and conditions on the bridge. Um, you know, the current plan with DCR is that that biking occurs in Alewife Brook Parkway, which uh, I think many of us would choose not to do. Uh, and that, you know, there's also a pedestrian ramp and access that exists on DCR land next to our 402 Ridge site that's sort of poorly designed and underutilized. So there's existing infrastructure that um, making the best of that and making the best use of that, I think would make huge steps forward in connectivity and, and accessibility. Um, that could probably in some cases happen sooner and, uh, you know, with, with, with smaller changes in some of the big pieces approach. So I, I, I appreciate the big thinking, but also want to encourage a little bit of maybe smaller incremental thinking to go as well. And uh, that's, that's all I, I have to add, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the, the council may have. Thank you. That was good. And the reason we included in this is if you, all of you in the AL Life Envision, it includes both sides of Alewife Brook Parkway, but kind of with a cutout for that apartment, which, and yet it's part of the same geography, it's part of the same ecosystem. So that's why it seems to make sense to include it, because certainly the Alewife plan, as noted by Ms. Peters, includes all of Alewife, Jerry's Pond, IQHQ, as well as the shopping center on the other side. So now I think that Mike Nakagawa has a few slides to share in just a few minutes, and then we'll wrap up. Mike, you're on mute. Couldn't find the thing to unmute. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? And can you see it? Um, hi, I'm Mike Nakagawa. I'm on the leadership teams of the Alewife Study Group, Fresh Pond Residents Alliance, and Alewife Neighbors Inc., as well as I've been on City's Climate Change Plan uh, uh, Resiliency Planning. Um, I have a few slides with only a few points each, so this will move quickly. But this picture shows how, um, and I appreciate the previous, was it Noah? because that's a great lead into what I wanted to talk about. Um, this picture shows how the commuter rail tracks separate North Alewife with the Red Line, the Minuteman Trail, Hustle Field, and the highest concentration of affordable housing in the city, and South Alewife, which has Danahy Park, jobs in the Quadrangle, and retail at and across Fresh Pond Mall. But there are only three uh, crossing points in this area. Um, I don't know why I have to get to the next slide. Um, so there are definite connectivity problems. There's no good access to LF Station, the Minuteman Trail, or Russell Field from the south by bike. There's no safe access to the mall or Danny Park from the north without a car. Um, there's little access to jobs without a car. The entrance at Fresh Pond Mall um, is dangerous by foot or by bike. And um, there's been a proposed bridge um, between Range Towers and the mall, but that has been po opposed by the private property owner in the past. So um, this is an overview picture from the Cambridge Res Redevelopment Authority's draft report from October of last year. And one of their first priorities is a multi-use path along the north side of the tracks. Um, however, it is a path to nowhere. <clears throat> it doesn't connect to the Parkway Bridge doesn't get to a destination better than what exists now. Um, so if we were to add an underpass connecting Jefferson Park to Danahy Park, that would provide safe access for kids um, and others from Ridge Towers Jefferson to Danahy Park and the mall. It would also allow access to LF Station, Russell Field, the Minuteman Trail from the south by bike without having to go on the parkway. Um, and underpasses are much easier for cyclists than bridges, which is why I'm suggesting that um, that be the, the method. So this would be safe access for kids by bike to the sports fields at Russell and Russell Field and Danny. Um, but <clears throat> kids safety is one of my big concerns. And this also helps out with access to schools, um, the access to the Peabody School from from Ridge Towers, 
Jefferson Park is a long way downwind, shown in the magenta line. And biking is a key way for athletes to get to the high school without worrying about being late because of the frequent transit or traffic delays. But Ringe Avenue and Sherman Street are very dangerous for youth cyclists. Adding an underpass um, reduces travel along dangerous roads by cutting through Danahy Park to get to the Tobin School with only one block of street or um, getting to Garden Street, um, which is uh, the later connection. And then a commuter rail station completes the picture because it would come with a way to get across the tracks, um, allowing access to jobs in the Red Line and the Minuteman Trail, um, as well as from the commuter rail. And the commuter rail gives access to suburban jobs without a car for the residents in the area. Residents of the Quadrangle can also access the Red Line and Minuteman Trail. And uh, to reach the jobs in the Quadrangle, there'd be less uh, need for cars taking what the 2019 governor's report said was the most second most congested roadway in the state at 14 hours of congestion per day. Um, I asked Kent Johnson to look at population housing and employment data around the commuter rail station to compare that with an analysis that was done in 2015 for a commuter rail stop. And I asked for data using both half mile and one kilometer, which I've seen used lately from this proposed station that are considered to be walking distance. And the circles um, here are uh, those distances with the larger being the one kilometer boundary. And I won't go into the details, but population housing and jobs generally far exceed the standards for other communities when you're looking at Alewife um, and then making a compelling case for having one here with more development still to come. Putting an underpass and commuter rail station in one project would correct a lot of the issues we have in this long neglected part of the town. And this is the time to act with Jefferson Park because it's currently being redesigned with draft plans almost ready for permits. We need to make sure the plans don't preclude an underpass. So that's the end of what I wanted to present. Um, stop sharing. Thank you so much. I love that chart of the, uh, I think we could include it. I'm sure CDD has seen it, but I hadn't seen it before about the circle with the number of jobs um, quite nearby. And I'm sure Noah has seen it as well. Um, Doug Brown to leave in a few minutes. Um, uh, I will call on next uh, to round out that presentation and then we'll move into the next stage. Doug? Can you hear me, can you hear me Patty? Yes. Uh, great, thanks for having me. Um, it was been a, it's been a long road. Um, going way, way back uh, with the formation of uh, this working group and, and their efforts. Um, I think I had two big takeaways from the process. Um, and I, I would encourage um, the council to pursue and the city to pursue these two efforts. And the first is, I think it's very important now that we have a document, a plan and a set of, of urban design guidelines that go with it, uh, that we actually update the zoning. Um, that was always assumed to be a part of this effort, is that the, the zoning at LWF would actually be updated to reflect the working group's efforts. Um, and I would beg the council to actually pursue uh, some attempt at holistic zoning for this area, because what we're facing right now is the continued onslaught of individual zoning proposals by individual owners and developers. And it's just not in the city's best interest to pursue things on a piecemeal basis. Um, the second one is I would encourage the everyone involved to look for the easy wins. And I think a lot of the easy wins are actually in the area of connectivity. As Mike's already mentioned, um, you know, an underpass. And I would only point out that historically there actually was an underpass at that location that was used by the brickyard. Um, and I would also encourage um, us to think about how we want to use the Route 2 bridge. Um, I previously mentioned to Patty that that Route 2 bridge is actually proposed to be redeveloped uh, and rebuilt in 2025 under MassDOT's uh, latest um, long-term plan. So we should think about what that looks like from a pedestrian standpoint. Um, I think there's some other easy wins. One that's been discussed repeatedly is, is around Terminal Road and how it can enable connectivity on the other side of the tracks in the same way that, that an underpass could on the north side. Um, I think without a doubt, regardless of what happens on Mooney Street, I think we do need to think seriously about rebuilding Smith Place 
in the same way that we rebuild New Street because um, it's just not a tenable situation. It literally has no sidewalks in some sections and it's subject to a lot of heavy truck traffic and it actually has a lot of pedestrian um, uh, use. So I think in the short term, we have to figure out a plan uh, for how we're gonna make that better because anything that happens on Mooney Street goes through Smith Place. Um, I think there's some places where, you know, we've already put effort. So, sal you know, behind the stop and shop, I mean, sorry, behind the, the Whole Foods, we already own um, the railroad right of way. And we've already set aside hundreds of thousands of dollars under the CPA to design a path there. And so I would ask that we, we complete that design um, so that in the future, that project is shovel ready. That would obviously connect to any sort of underpass and it also brings um, the Greenway to North Cambridge in some ways. Um, I think the, the other one that has to be discussed because it's been being discussed since at least 1989 and Mike alluded to the idea of a rail stop. And, you know, at, um, at Fenway, the state paid for a rail stop and that's for a, a, an immediate neighborhood population of about 900 people. So um, I don't think it's, it's beyond us to come up with a solution um, to crack that issue. And in fact, it's written into our municipal ordinances in the vehicle trip reduction ordinance that actually asked for our plan for a rail stop there. That was in 1992. Um, and then the final piece is, you know, we had a lot of discussions this spring about bridges and where they should be. Um, I would only point out that um, we do own uh, a number of, we do own a number of easements, right of ways, and pieces of land throughout this district. And we have negotiated at last count $1.7 million in contributions from developers for the design of a bridge. So I, as a, as a task force member would ask, what are we doing with that money? Have we spent it? And if so, what do we got to show for it? Because I think one of the things that all of this starts with is a, some sort of completed design for how we're gonna get it across the tracks. Um, so again, just to reiterate, we, I think we need to update the zoning and I think we need to pursue any and every connectivity um, project that we can um, because I think we need to lay down a network of paths and roads prior to the build out that's forecast for 2030. Um, those are my primary concerns and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more from the rest of the panelists. Thank you, uh, Doug Brown. That um, and part what we're focusing on by focusing on the zoning and the public spaces, we can't totally control what a developer will build, but what we can control is the zoning throughout this entire area, and then making any kind of decisions around the public spaces and the connectivity. There are three people signed up for public comment, so I think we'll go to those next, and then I'll go to uh, Councilor Carlo and Councilor McGovern, and the Vice Mayor for comments. So. Of the clerk or and Stuart, you have the floor. Hi, I live on Wheeler Street, and I feel like um, some of the other people in this area were in the, the heart of the beast. I'm uh, submitting this comment along with Ann Tennis, who's the Highlands Neighborhood Association, uh, you know, nominal head, because she couldn't be here today. Um, and I just wanted to point out that a few months ago, our neighborhood association was one of several signers of a letter to you asking you to postpone active development proposals until the ambition report was addressed and approved to commit to an implementation plan and after approval to hire a firm to write the zoning guidelines for each part of the city. So I appreciate that these items are being emphasized today. And since then, we've learned that there's a lot more uh, development in the pipeline. And that's only, you know, the last couple of months. And we don't know how many of these are public. But we would like to thank Vice Mayor Mallet and Councilor Nolan for co-sponsoring our uh, neighborhood initiated policy order asking the city to work with the state and the state police to develop a plan to proactively manage the massive amount of traffic 
congestion from these projects that will probably extend way beyond 2025. And we're grateful to the council for passing the order. But as others have pointed out, with no implementation plan and no zoning guidelines, we're stuck in a time warp and individuals, individual developers control the future. So to keep this short, um, we thought about three, what we think of as no brainer infrastructure improvements, primarily on our side, quote unquote, of the parkway. One is I've heard many comments about the city wanting to get people out of cars. And it's clear that it's time, way past time to initiate conversations with the MBTA about an alewife commuter rail stop. And two, the most amount of development in the Highlands Quad area is next to Fresh Pond Parkway. On Wheeler Street in back of the Eversource substation, there's 525 luxury rental units with 20% affordable housing ready very soon. And we really need a terminal road connection with sidewalks for sharing with bicycles and pedestrians. It would be nice to change the intersection, I believe, at Fresh Pond Parkway and Terminal Road so that it would take some pressure off the rotaries there. And again, to emphasize the or re-emphasize the need for a bridge, the uh, latest dream for one of the far northwest corner was solely for a developer's benefit, but the area that really needs a bridge or some simple inexpensive walkway is over the tracks to make the Ridge Avenue side of the parkway available to Danny Park, the city's new accessible playground, the shopping mall, and of course the schools. Thank you for for this meeting and thank you for devoting serious consideration to the infrastructure in this area. Thank you. The next speaker is James Williamson. Mr. Williamson, you have the floor. James does not appear to have joined the Zoom. Okay. The next speaker is John Chun. Hold on one second. Sorry, um, Paula. It looks like he may be in as a different name. One second. Can you hear James, me? please go ahead. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. My name is James. Here we go again. My name is James Williamson, 1000 Jackson Place, Jefferson Park. I'm actually a person who lives in Jefferson Park. And um, I've, I'm kind of tired of being ignored. I've lived here for 14 years. When I first moved here, there was no tenant council. I set about initiating the process, very onerous with lots of obstacles from the housing authority to try to organize a tenant council. I hope that someone else would be uh, interested in, in, in sharing it. I ended up being president of the tenant council kind of by default. I think I know a little bit about this area and about this neighborhood. And I have been ignored. I put a tremendous amount of time and effort into understanding what goes on here and into advocating for things that seemed um, important that might matter and have been ignored for the 14 years that I've lived here by virtually everybody, including city councilors to whom I have taken the trouble of writing extensive comments with ideas and suggestions. So I'm gonna talk about some of those things that have been ignored. Um, one is about transit. For over 10 years, the, 80, the only bus that serves this area is the 83 bus. The 83 bus cannot make it really around the rotary in the, in the, uh, in the layover area where it turns around next to the baseball field. Um, uh, it, the, the drivers get stuck, they try to go over the curb and they get stuck in the mud and tow trucks have to come and get them out. Um, somebody without any communication with people like myself who've been involved in advocating around this for years decided to put fake boulders in the rotary. Uh, that was not really a solution to the problem of a tight turning radius. Um, another issue there is the bus goes over a raised sidewalk and when and then on the Ringe Ave side, there's a there's a divot. Cars drag their undercarriage on that raised sidewalk. The bus has nearly been tipping over, literally nearly tipping over, for years. I have brought this up for years 
at the Cambridge Transit Advisory Committee and been ignored for years. I also advocated for restoring the, um, the time, the duration of the opening of the DCR uh, owned and managed pool. When I first moved here, it was open through Labor Day weekend. A year or a year after I first moved here, I was noticed how silent it was on Labor Day weekend and it was shut down. Um, there's much more to say. I don't get paid $187,000 to represent people from the house who live in Jefferson Park, but I would like to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Next James. speaker is John Chan. Mr. Chan, you have yes. the floor. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and the members of the committee. Uh, my name is John Chun from 48 Luma Street. Um, I submitted an email this morning regarding the Envision plan and how I like uh, seeing that to convert into zoning. And um, I did enjoy seeing uh, Ms. Peter's presentation just now. And uh, as, much, as much as I understand about the Envision plan and specifically the Alewife District plan, there are very good elements that I like to see being enforced by zoning uh, by the city. Uh, one example I'd like to give you is um, there was a recent development proposal by CCNF uh, to develop and build um, buildings along Mooney Street. Um, and uh, they picked out some elements of, um, from uh, the Alewife district plan. Um, but as they were, they were doing it, they cherry picked what would give them advantage uh, while they were hiding things that they, they, they did not uh, want to share. Uh, specifically around that uh, street cross section that Ms. Peters uh, presented, um, they did not uh, want to build that Mooney Street uh, as wide as uh, what was called for by the, uh, by the AY district plan. So um, with um, the current situation, I believe that developers might come in, uh, pick and choose what they want to see from uh, the, the plan. Um, and they may not um, uh, adhere to uh, the rest of the plan, but I do believe that the plan really needs to be in place um, as a whole and not as a piecemeal, because uh, I think the plan really is a good plan, uh, only if it's um, really implemented um, as a whole um, in the entire quadrangle and the uh, triangle. Uh, so that is a, um, uh, a request that I have is to, uh, start the process of um, reviewing and uh, adopting uh, the plan and then turning that into uh, the zoning. Um, and I also like to speak on behalf of my two daughters who submitted an email this morning uh, about their request to build a um, uh, railroad uh, pedestrian crossing uh, connecting the Rinji Towers and the uh, Alewife, um, uh, the Fresh Pond uh, shopping mall. Uh, so um, I, I did hear from today's discussions that there were many proposals about underpass as well as other connectivity. Um, and my daughters really would like to see um, that crosswalk there um, so that they can uh, go between um, Danahy Park uh, area um, and over to the, um, the Russell Fields area. So there are, there are a lot of uh, sports um, um, facilities on both sides of the railroad tracks and now the railroad tracks are really acting as a barrier for kids to move back and forth. Uh, so that is uh, something that we'd like to ask you to consider. And I, I, we do believe that the railroad crossing would be a very cost-effective solution as long as we do get a buy-in from the MBTA. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chun. Uh, there was a, uh, Lee Ferris has her hand up. Does that mean you would like to speak, Ms. Ferris? Or if we could enable her, if she doesn't, she can decline. Yes, Lee, you're Absolutely. enabled. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Councilor Nolan, there are two more public speakers signed uh, I, up. I believe they're, calling, they're, they're already panelists. Is it Mr. Nakagawa and Mr. Brown? Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I, 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 excuse me. Are we going to close public comment now, Councilor? After, after Lee Ferris. Okay. Thanks. I did try to sign up, but for some reason the form wouldn't let me. Um, my, I just have a few brief comments. Thanks for the presentations and uh, by everybody in the comments by uh, prior speakers. I'm, I'm wondering if the counselors could ask the CDD staff 
why the city has not prepared zoning for alewife. Um, because as um, Mike Brown said, CDD had said at the beginning of the envision process that that would happen after uh, we finished coming up with a plan for alewife. And in fact, I think there's similar implementation problems for all of um, envision. Uh, so I, I know it's a lot of work to create a, a draft zoning, but are there other reasons, other impediments? If so, it would, would be good to know. I also think that in this process, it would be good if there would be a list and a map of all the current development proposals uh, so that they could be compared, what they're proposing to do could be compared with Envision. And um, I, strongly agreed that we do need actual zoning. Otherwise, developers will continue picking and choosing which elements of Envision they want to follow. And lastly, here's my sort of uh, blue sky idea. It looks like we're going to be getting $25, $25 million back from the T for uh, the Green Line. Couldn't we take that $25 million and turn around and build the bridge at Alewife that we want with that money. So I know it's blue sky, but I, I really think we need to just pay for that bridge, put it in a bond if we need to, do whatever we need to do, pay for it and get started on it. Because I think as long as we expect developers to provide that for free for us, then that's going to mean that they feel free to pick and choose what which elements of the envision plan they want. So for example, the CCF proposal did not at all follow the light industrial that was um, described by Ms. Peterson. So um, let's do what we need to do um, as a city government to get what we want, the green spaces, the parks, the bridges, et cetera, and then have developers operate within clear zoning that we have designed and passed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I move to, do I have a motion to close public comment? So moved. On closing public comment, Councilor Nolan? Yes. Yes. Councilor Carlone? Yes. Count Vice Mayor Mallon? Yes. Councilor McGovern? Yes. Councilor Zondervan? Yes. And public comment is closed on the affirmative vote with five in favor. Thank you. And thank you to all the uh, presenters as well as the speakers. I now open it up. I have uh, Councilor Carlone and Councilor McGovern next on the list for either questions of anyone on the panel or comments or uh, whatever related to, uh, to the topic at hand. Thank you, Councilor Carlone. Uh Madam Chair, so our initial comments are both questions and comments? I think given that it's three o'clock, so we're halfway through the meeting, I, I, I think you can either do questions or comments because I'm you. not sure how much longer we'll I, I get noticed, around. I noticed in the mapping, and one might have come after the other, that the CCNF site that we all have discussed quite a bit had two different codes on it, one purple, one yellow, yellow for housing, purple for industry. And which is it? Or it's both. It was classified as two different uses, predominantly. Yeah, um, I believe it was initially classified in one way, but it has since subsequently changed. Perhaps through, uh, Assistant City Manager Farouk or her team might be able to comment on that. Um, through, through you, Chair. Um, I'm going to ask Melissa to, to comment on, on that, but these um, just keep in mind that this work that Melissa presented dates back to when the Envision plan was completed and has not been updated then for new um, ownership, et cetera. So some of this... Uh, is based on pre-existing ownership and maps to the zoning districts. So I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to see more. Thanks through, through you, Madam Chair. The, the map that I showed was a land use map that showed the 
predominant or likely or desirable land use um, for that area. So the, um, it shows that the um, northwest uh, uh, part of the quad uh, was uh, primarily the light industrial zoning district, but that it would allow residential near the highlands, which was preferential from the community um, perspective. So it's the zoning district um, is different from the land use map, um, but that, um, if, if that uh, makes sense. I, I understand. One was the zoning district, the other is preference. Um, that's good. Uh, on, you mentioned uh, Ms. Peters' mode share and you said less than 40%. 40% of what? Commercial? Uh, I, uh, through you, Madam Chair, 40% um, auto car, car trips from development. I got it. I got it. So that has to be highly reviewed by the planning board and staff on each project. Yeah, primarily through parking requirements as well as the TDM review. Okay, I, I know Mr. Reardon's here and I know the reasons why we want the manager's administration want a high percentage of commercial development. But I think you will find the vast majority of people on this call will want dominant residential development and that all we hear is we need more residential. Um, and I think this is going to be a big issue for the rest of my lifetime in Cambridge. And uh, I won't expect a response now, but um, on connections, I agree they're critical. Everybody has said that. So how will you prioritize a very large block when only a portion of the block is being developed at one time? which is my way of saying, we have to show where those connections should be inside of a large block. How, how will that be done? If we don't say it, how will it be done? How do the two pieces connect? Through the chair, um, I, I'm, I don't know if Melissa understood that question a little bit, but I'm, I'm struggling a little what bit, I'm so let me try. Your, your blocks are super blocks. Mm -hmm. They appear to be, I'm guessing, 500 by 800 or something like that in size, which is office blocks, light industrial blocks. And yet you show these secondary roads and pedestrian paths in between. But um, if we don't show look at property lines and don't show where it should be, you'll never have the two connecting. So how do we do that if you're only dealing with a part of a block at a time? I, I get it. Thank, thank you um, through you, Chair. Thank you for um, clarifying that, Councillor. Um, yes, completely agree that the ultimate urban fabric that we want to see in this area is not one that appears like super blocks. Um, however, given that one of the uh, priorities, and I think this goes to your prior question uh, or comment, was one of the priorities that really emerged through this process was a desire to see light industrial in this area. And um, principally to to help with economic empowerment and um, help provide good jobs that have low barrier to entry um, and that provide possibility of people um, finding footholds to then um, you know, progress economically and, and not just remain at uh, like often retail jobs will do is that once you are in there, you kind of stay at a very um, low salary. There's not really a growth path there. So that emerged through this process as a pretty strong priority. Melissa can certainly say more about that, but that's what resulted in 
some of the, the larger footprints that you would see on the plan. Um, however, we completely agree with you that from a planning perspective, you don't want blocks to be um, super blocks and have permeability to the extent possible. Um, and so that's why you see the urban design plan the, the way that it looks. Now to the point of um, how would we make that happen if only part of the block is, uh, is being developed, um, which is that you know, none of those uh, intermediate block connections are prescriptive that they must be at that exact place, but they are um, conceptual that we would wanna see those happen. Uh, and we've had this sort of situation in, in fact, even in the Ilwife area in the past um, on the Eastern part of the quadrangle. Um, and you might not, you know, even if it's a smaller, uh, building that is being built or part of a block that's being redeveloped, uh, we have certainly off through the special permit process um, asked developers to maintain or, or build in connections or retain space for connections. This has happened um, on um, I'm trying to, on Fawcett Street, uh, it's happened on even on New Street for pedestrian connection on Fawcett Street for the intermediate connection um, east west. So there, there is a lot of precedent for doing that through the process. Um, and I'll also say that the zoning, the, even the existing zoning, um, creates an incentive to make that happen. So there, there is in fact bonus GFA that somebody would get if they build in the intermediate desired connections as referenced in the plan. Um, so that means that people in fact have a, there's an incentive for them to do what the plan um, asks them to, and it's easier for the planning board then to require that through the special permit conditions. Um, and I don't know if Melissa or even Jeff might want to add more on, on that topic. Let me jump in. I know we don't have much time. Open space. I know you all know that the amount of pedestrians around Fresh Pond is measured every day. And the max is 1,500. And we're close to that on days. Um, for that reason, and all the normal city life reasons, plus canopy, plus flooding, um, I feel the plan is very deficient in open space. Now, I've heard through three, excuse me, two different landowners, commercial landowners, that the city proposed open space is for sale and has been for over two months. The city has not moved on this. How can we be confident that that is going to happen, that purchase? Your whole project is based on that spine uh, working as an urban design element. We know the city is low. It's less than half of the average city. This neighborhood community will be less than half of that much less, it's about a third of what our average city is. Um, when are we going to move on this? Um, I th I, I'm just stunned, to be honest. And when I heard that this is the case, I began to move, think that we do not have an implementation process going on that counts. So I would encourage you and tell us who we should speak to. And I will speak to the manager as will my colleagues that I think what you propose and I get why we're pro development is absolutely not sufficient. And Fresh Pond is not going to balance it given that it's primarily pedestrians walking the length. Um, I think that is absolutely key. And lastly, um, just bear with me. Well, I'll stop, I'll stop there. Oh, access. 
we know this is miserable from a car point of view and even 40% of new development being car oriented, I don't believe it can work. I honestly don't. And I, I would love to see a traffic study that says it would without major changes, including a shuttle from Alewife, which hasn't been mentioned at all other than the word shuttle. Um, we need two bridges. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. The bridge at the future commuter station will not happen until there's a commuter station. The MPT owns it. They're not going to participate until they know that it works with what they want to propose. And they will not move for, I've worked with the MPTA on two different sites. And I can tell you right now, they're light years behind and understaffed. So the real, and nobody wants the bridge on Smith Street if there's only one, I get that. That will be the first bridge if there's a bridge ever. And we need a bridge immediately. Thank you for your work. And I really appreciate the whole discussion. I thought all the comments, public and private, were uh, very positive and very realistic. Oh, one last thing on zoning, you better test the zoning before you do the zoning. And that's through urban design, site by site, block by block, as you've drawn it. Thank you. Madam Dr. Chair. Carlon, it sounds like you weren't, you were laying out kind of questions and and wishes and requests as opposed to waiting for a specific response. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And I'm we sure the city is, we don't have time for that. Yes. Well, yes. They'll just get back to us on how to buy all the land, do the traffic study and complete the bridge and have zoning throughout, right? Great. Next mm -hmm. up, uh, Councillor Madam, McGovern, Madam I believe. Chair, could and I'm sure, yeah. uh, could I just respond quickly to a couple of his points uh, based on the Vision AI Life uh, working group? Um, one about the residential area in the northwest corner of the quad. Um, that is an isolated place that takes away from light industrial use and was not part of the original discussions and just showed up initially the day Cap Captain and Forbes presented at the planning board. Um, throughout the discussions, I think the whole area was deemed to be light industrial. And I want to make sure that we don't shortchange light and industrial and use the definition that's in the, the plan, not things like blue, brew pubs, which are suggested by cabinet government forms, which are essentially food service. So that's important for us in terms of residential. There have been 4,000 new units of housing developed in the area or permitted or coming on board since 2010 within a half mile of Alewife Station. So there's a lot of residential going on, but we're not getting any of the support for the residents going onward. So I think that should uh, be uh, addressed and limiting development by light industrial use was limiting property values. So light owners could afford it, but that has now shifted by making these other allowances. So it's going to be hard for a straight light, light industrial owner to uh, afford the property. And that's all I was gonna say, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Nakagawa. Uh, Councilor McGovern and then Councilor Zondervan and then Vice Mayor Mallon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, thank you to everyone uh, for their work on this, uh, both from the community as, as well as staff. Um, I completely agree with the need for the rail station. Um, you know, we're going to need multiple bridges, as, pe as people have talked about, um, certainly one from uh, Fresh Pond Apartments, uh, as well as on the other side of the highway. Um, you know, I, I would say to the city that I know all things being equal, um, we would love it if someone else paid uh, for these bridges, but what are we going on 20 plus years that we've been waiting for that to happen. So at some point, I don't know how much longer we need to wait if we're really serious. We keep hearing that the city wants this, the city wants this, the city wants this. Well, the city should pay for it um, if we want it that bad and let's bond it out and use our AAA bond rating to our advantage. Um, you know, enough waiting. Um, even even with all the development that's happened there, what, we, uh, what, what was the figure? One point seven million. I mean, long way to go, uh, you know, at that rate to get a couple bridges. So um, we really need to step up on that uh, as soon as possible. Um, 
in terms of the, you know, I, I completely agree that that we need to move forward with um, making some zoning changes and, and clarifying some things. I do caution folks a little bit because um, you know, we have we have zoning throughout the city, and that doesn't stop developers from coming in and filing petitions to ask for more. And I, whatever zoning we pass, I will guarantee you that a developer is going to come in and file. It's not going to do away with individual petitions being filed. I will guarantee you a developer will come in and say, oh, this is the current zoning, but I want to go a little bit higher. I want to go a little bit denser, and this is what I'll give you. So let's, you know, that's not going away. I, I, I don't think um, developers will always try to improve their situation. And no matter what we do, we're going to get individual one-offs and we're going to have to deal with those. Um, I'm really glad to see the focus on light industrial. Uh, I think that is really important, um, but I do want to, I, I want to ask about the, um, on the retail side, and I know there was a slide that talked about a shopping center, that can be a, a lot of different things, that could be an outlet mall, like Assembly Row, uh, that has housing above it, or it could be just a quarter of a mile down the road, you've got Station Landing, that has residential above it and it has a dry cleaner and a pizza place and a drugstore and a convenience store. Um, you know, if we're thinking of on the retail end, I would much rather be more of a station landing uh, model. Um, you know, we wanna talk about traffic. Well, you know what, if people don't have to jump in their cars to go buy a gallon of milk, you're gonna cut down on traffic. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'd like to, I don't know if there's been more thought sort of given to that. So I, I appreciate the light industrial, but as we're building more residential, we also need conveniences for people who live there to be able to get their business done without jumping in cars. Um, you know, and then the other part is we can build a lot of things and we can zone for a lot of things, but that doesn't mean people are going to come. So is there, a, is there a talk with the economic development department or others about, you know, how do we actually get businesses, you know, we, we can, we can zone for a convenience store. That doesn't, I'm not opening one. That doesn't mean you know someone's going to come there and, and and do it. So, do we have any plan in terms of how are we going to attract um, businesses to this location, or do we feel like it's just going to happen because we're Cambridge and people want to do business here? To the chair, um, Melissa, jump in if there's more that you need to, to add on this. Um, but um, absolutely, the economic development team was very much part of working on, on this particular plan. Um, and they did feel like light industrial was, you know, and as well as our consultants, uh, that light industrial, while challenging, we would be able to, um, if we had enough critical mass, we would be able to draw folks. Uh, the neighborhood serving retail that um, you're talking about, Councillor, is actually a lot more challenging. Uh, and that's why um, the plan actually talks about aligning that along the main streets rather than further in the back, uh, so that it's not just serving uh, the residents here, but also folks who might be uh, commuting through. So uh, the retail tends to be, and I, I once, um, one of our Cambridge retailers, long-standing, well-respected, um, the previous owner of Tags used to say that retail is the, the most delicate flower in the garden. Um, and it's in fact true because it re retail always will follow the population and it needs people to support it. There's, um, unlike other businesses, the, um, the margins are so narrow for the most part that it's really hard to get retail um, unless a retailer feels that they, they have enough of a, a market, whether it be right in the location, if they're neighborhood serving, or if there's a way for people to get there. So um, I think the, that's why we felt that the most likely, and this is working with our economic development staff, working with the experience in the, the city amongst our community planning staff around this and, and the, uh, the development community in this area to, to think through where that would be most likely to be successful would be along um, either Concord Ave or um, some of the main Northwest, I mean, North-South spines like um, Smith Place where you're likely to see the most amount of people. 
uh, even though we would love to see it along the east-west corridor that's more internal, but it feels like it's gonna, in the present scenario, it's gonna be hard to achieve, but we did feel like there, when you have enough people which we're starting to see critical mass there, that we're, we would be able to attract some amount of neighborhood serving retail. Thank you. Um, and it's, I, you know, I know it's hard, um, but it's part of the reason we are sort of in this situation because as new developments happened and, and build and residential was built, pe developers said, well, there's not enough people here. We can't do that. And then the next project comes and it says, well, there's not enough people here. We can't do it. We're starting to get to the point where we got to think, you know, broader than that because there are going to be enough people there and it is growing and, and um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's just vitally important for, to create that sense of community and neighborhood uh, as, as well as convenience for people. Um, I didn't see this in the slides and I'm sorry if, if I missed it. Um, what is the, is there any talk of, maybe this gets to Councillor Carlone's point about the city buying some property, but what is the, what is the thought around some city functions like a fire station, a library or school? We heard that a lot with the CCNF conversation that um, you know, we needed some of those amenities there. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm a little mixed on the school, but I certainly think the fire station is, is vital because trying to get, even with sirens, trying to get there um, from here on out is, is, I don't know how you do it at, at, at rush hour. So um, is that in this plan at all or did I miss it or? Um, Melissa, do you wanna talk about what's in the plan and then I can add in anything else that's needed? Uh, sure, through you, Madam Chair, we um, we didn't preclude the um, siting of public facilities, um, but we also didn't identify locations for them, um, partly um, for, for concern around showing it on a particular property owner site, but certainly if there is a uh, need for a public facility, um, that's an opportunity for, for city investment and we defer to um, the council and the manager's office on that. And, and that's something, I mean, if you think in terms of a fire station, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, some massive, you know, building, you put two trucks out there that can hold things down, you know, while others come. I mean, it's just, but again, that we can't force a private owner to build a fire station, which is why we need to accumulate property if, if, if that is available so that we have control over what goes there. Um, lastly, through you, Madam Chair, um, and I'm sure we'll get to this, but, you know, the, and we've heard a couple, I think Mr. Brown said this, um, you know, the $6 trillion question is now what? Is CDD going to be drafting zoning for us to discuss and, and, and move forward? Um, you know, we, we certainly have a lot of great ideas and there's been a lot of work done. How do we how do we make that a reality and, and um, make this happen? Through you, Chair, Chair um, two, two thoughts with regards to that question, um, Councillor. And I think um, this conversation is, is helpful because I have to say that in prior conversations, we um, have not felt a clear sense of whether we have the council's endorsement on this plan or not. Um, and I think zoning is uh, in some ways incredibly hard because it's so detailed, um, particularly for something as complex as an area study. But uh, at the same time, in some ways, the easiest part is to write the zoning. The much harder part is to know what it is that you are trying to make happen through the zoning. Um, so we would wanna make sure that this plan actually has the blessing of the city council before we um, start to embark on a large task like translating the plan into, into zoning. Um, we are ready to do that, uh, but we also want, would wanna know that that is in fact a priority for the, for the council uh, because it is gonna take up a lot of the um, the zoning and development staff's time uh, in terms of what they are able to pay attention, you know, to really focus on in terms of the, um, the zoning tasks that the council would like us to focus on. So we are, um, if, if it's the council's will that this be the top priority, we are absolutely ready to pivot to it. 
I, through you, through you, Madam Chair, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, obviously I'm not going to speak for the council. Um, we can't even begin to discuss the zoning and ordinance until you write it. So I think, you know, getting something in front of us, nothing comes out the same way it goes in usually. And so I think you, there's a great starting point here. There's been a lot of work here. It's now time to take it to that next step to get some zoning done and written so that we can go to ordinance, we can have public hearings, we can talk about it, we can amend it as, as we see fit and, and move it forward. Um, I would say again, and we talked about this during the budget season, um, you have a ton on your plate. Um, you know, we file a lot of petitions for you to consider, citizens file a lot of petitions for you to consider. Um, you know, if you, if, if you need to contract out some help or do something like that, then please ask for it. And I think we would support it. I think, I think it's, you know, I don't want to make it more difficult on you, but I think it's also, at least speaking for myself, it's a, it's a little hard because there are so many priorities, right? And it's hard to say, well, you know, this is more important than building on, I mean, we're still waiting six years on the, the plan to build on city-owned parking lots in Central Square. Um, you know, so um, there are so many competing priorities. They are all important and they all have to, you know, have some progress made on them. So if you need additional help, I would certainly be one uh, to support that. Um, but I think, you know, we need to move this stuff forward uh, and get this conversation to the next step. That would be my, my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McGovern. And to just quickly clarify that, it sounds like Assistant City Manager Farouk, you would want the council to ask you to write the zoning to be clear it's a priority because Councilor McGovern said very clearly it is a priority. And yet, and you said you haven't quite heard that, but you're hearing it much more strongly today. And then he said, we'll just write the zoning. But if you if you give us guidance on what you would need, because it sounds like, and I don't, I don't mean to just go in front of Councilor Zondervan and the Vice Mayor, but um, th thank you, Chair. No, we certainly are hearing um, that today. I think I, one thing that would be helpful is to know that this plan, that the council feels like this is a good starting point at least because um, it will take a lot of work to translate that this into, into zoning. Uh, but if you think that this is a really bad idea or some basic concept here, doesn't make sense. Um, for instance, like, you know, the, the question of should light industrial be here at all or should this all be prioritizing housing? That is a very um, foundational question. And it would be good to know that we have generally the support of council in terms of going the way of the light industrial before um, Jeff and his team spent, you know, weeks weeks putting that together into zoning. So that's the sort of, you know, just if, if base, basically this plan looks like a good starting point, we are, we can, we can prioritize that. Thank you. And I, Councillor Zondervan and then Vice Mayor Mallon still have yet to speak. Councillor Zondervan. Thank you, Madam Chair, to you. Um, thanks to the staff for this presentation. Um, I apologize if I'm a little slow today. I, I got my second vaccine vaccine shot yesterday, so <laughs> why didn't do that? <laughs> um, We're glad you got I, it. Well, thank you. So am I. <laughs> um, I. I do find it a little bit frustrating. You know, I I, I think the the plan is certainly well intentioned, and and I I, I love the idea that we would have light industrial, um, you know, companies or ideally even co-ops in this location creating sustainable jobs for people. But as with pretty much every aspect of this plan, I don't understand how we make that happen because even if you write the zoning, you, you're still at, at best providing incentives, but you can't require that it be, um, this or that. So I, I just, I, I really have a hard time wrapping my head around like, how do we actually get what we want? You know, like we all agree that we want a commuter train station there, but nobody seems to be able to tell me how do we actually get it. We want a bridge and an underpass, but we just can't seem to get there. And 
you know, the the one obvious tool that we that we have that we are apparently refusing to use is that we as the city built this stuff. But but that doesn't seem to be a, an option here. So and I just I just find it frustrating. I don't really know what to tell you. Like, is this a good plan? Should you spend time writing the zoning? I don't know because I don't understand how that, that zoning um, written down would lead to the outcomes that we want. Um, through, through you, Chair, I'll, I'll try to address that super quickly, which is that zoning is not an ideal tool to develop infrastructure. It's you know, we we have found a way to try to to make that happen, and and it does, but it's a very very slow tool for for that process. So you are seeing certain pieces happen, but it will it will if that's the only tool we rely on, it will take time to manifest itself. So I have to admit that, even though I wish I could say that it would be faster. Um, the um, in terms of the land uses, that is something that zoning does influence or can influence more strongly. Um, you still can't, you're, uh, you're exactly right, Councilor Zondervan, you absolutely cannot require something because if somebody is not going to redevelop their site, they're not going to, we're not going to get the outcome we want. And even if they do, if three different things are permitted, they might choose something that is allowed at a lower density if they feel like that's their right, um, if that's their mission or if that's a more, more profitable thing. So what we are always trying to do when framing the zoning is to try to create, tilt the incentives in such a way that they're in favor of the outcome that we desire the most. So that's really the, I think the extent to which zoning can go, uh, because really limiting, I mean, we've actually worked the reverse in Cambridge to try to broaden zoning from where it used to be just one thing was required, because that is also not a good, good way, because you often find um, um, much more un unintended negatives from, from that approach. So, um, so it is, it, it is a planning tool, but it's only only one tool, and it's it does rely completely on private development to to manifest the end results. Thank you. So, I mean, I, you know, the only conclusion that I can draw is that we're using the wrong tools, and that if if we tr if we're truly committed to getting what we want, then we have to build it ourselves because there's no way to force the developers to build it. And in fact, with CCNF, we saw that they came in and they tried to, to zone their way, you know, rezone their way around um, some of what we wanted to do there. And, you know, as you pointed out, we, the developers seem to want more commercial in order to even, you know, build this light industrial. So it, it just, you know, again, it's it's very well intentioned, and and, and I love the the goals, but I just don't I just don't think we're going to get there. And and you know, at best, as you're pointing out, we might get there in 20 years. Well, that's too long. You know, we, we don't we don't have that kind of time. I mean, you're you're hearing from a lot of people that you know we we need this infrastructure now. So I, I don't. I mean, you know, this is obviously not in your control, but but it, it does feel like we need we need better tools here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Zondervan. Uh, Vice Mayor Mallon. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this has been a really interesting and sort of overdue conversation. So I appreciate everybody being here and doing this. I have um, a number of kind of jumbled thoughts that I will try to <laughs> synthesize uh, into some questions and some comments. Um, the first thing is, I just want to say I'm sort of agnostic to the idea of light industrial use and the amount of light industrial use we have envisioned um, in this district, because as several other councillors have spoken about, we had a zoning petition in front of us, which used the light industrial to um, force a lab use, right? So they were saying to keep the two uses that we wanted as light industrial, which was a brewery and a rock club, a rock climbing, um, which I, you know, 
that's not to me what I would think of when I was thinking about low income, you know, low entry barrier to entry jobs. Um, and using those as a lever to build labs in this district, which nowhere in the plan, nowhere in anybody's conversation ever said, geez, you know what we need is more labs um, over on in, in the Alewife district. So I just want us to be aware of some of the trade-offs we might get by sticking so closely to this light and industrial uh, idea and how much of it and what we might actually get as several counselors have noted, you know, before me astutely that, you know, you can zone for what you want, but then you're still going to end up getting a number of developers in front of us that we're going to ask for different things. Um, I think I really want to say, I know that um, Ms. Farouk said that, that CDD hasn't heard a clear mandate from the council on what we want to do here. I think um, what we all just went through with that particular zoning petition showed us that we do need to prioritize this. And I understand it's gonna be a big undertaking, but I think what you're probably hearing today from this committee, and we can certainly discuss it further at the, at the full city council to have that, um, that larger mandate is that we do need a clear, we do need zoning in front of us to discuss um, otherwise, we're just going to get another developer zoning petition and that, that's going to be sitting in front of us and taking up all of our time. We're going to have 12 ordinance committee hearings on something that may never pass. Um, I think we need to think about a five year connectivity plan above and outside of what um, any zoning might be, because I think we have all been talking about for so many years, a bridge here, a bridge there, an underpass here, a connectivity through here. I think we should probably think about what are those connection places that we need to be thinking about to meet all of our goals of connectivity, of climate change, resilience. Um, so some kind of plan with steps and how to get there. I also, um, you know, I'm curious about the easements that I know that we have along the railroad tracks. And if somebody, um, maybe Ms. Peters can start sharing her screen um, on slide or any of the slides really that show the map of the district and where those easements are and where we could think about um, where those, those connectivity pieces are from the quadrangle to the triangle. Because I don't even think I'm really clear on where those easements are and how many there are. We just hear that they they exist. Um, so that, that would be really, I think, important for us to discuss. And then in terms of the open space that has been brought up a few times, um, I am curious about both the opportunity for us to purchase the open space that is in the district, but also, I, I mean, I was just on, you know, real estate, looking at real estate during when we were having this conversation about CCF and understanding that there are parcels of land available for purchase right now um, that we could be thinking about as a city to prioritize for a fire station or a library or community center. So we aren't reliant on develop on, you know, giving away larger amounts of FAR to get a library, right? Um, I think the one thing that has frustrated me through this process in Alewife is that we were about to give away the store to maybe get a bridge. And we have shown in the past that we can purchase open space when it's available or we can purchase property when it's available. And I wanna make sure that we're doing that in this district because we aren't going to get all the things that we want here if we aren't prioritizing those, those purchases. So I guess my question, like I said, it was a, a jumble of thoughts. <laughs> But one of my major questions is really, where are those easements along the railroad tracks? And how are we reaching out to property owners who are selling um, to do those land transfers so that we can start you know, building what we really want to see in this district? Um, through, through you, Chair, I, um, I think we would need to create, it would be easiest if we created um, a map of where the easements are, because we would need to pull that information. I, I don't want to try to point that out um, on, on a map here um, without having the actual information. Um, so that's something that we certainly can create um, and we would need, 
I don't think that we at CDD have the full accounting of that. We would need to consult with the law department and with DPW to make sure that we have the comprehensive list. Um, keep in mind that just because we have an easement doesn't mean that we, it necessarily will be something that is um, that can be made into a, a connection because sometimes those easements uh, can ha can be pretty specific and um, you know, for a specific purpose. And so it may be something that would need to then be uh, renegotiated or they may or may not be wide enough for um, a connection. So um, so that's, you know, we can, we can certainly dig into that, get that research and um, bring that forward. Um, I'm gonna try to say this carefully because um, in terms of acquiring open space for, um, I mean, acquiring land for open space and potentially other amenities. I, I would say that's a question perhaps best directed to the city manager. Uh, and in, in our conversations, I think around principally around open space, um, I don't think it's, I don't think I'm saying something that he has not said before, which is that that's not something that is in, our capital plan for um, the next few years. Um, however, I think all of those are conversations that are appropriate to have between the council and the city manager. Oh, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, I certainly didn't want to put you on the spot in the hot seat with the city manager, but I do think this is where you know some type of plan, whether it's a, a three-year connectivity plan, three-year open space, or you know, public realm acquirement plan, something um, that comes along with this zoning so that it doesn't feel like um, it's happening in a vacuum and some kind of accounting of those easements and, you know, what they're principally purposed for could come as part of a connectivity plan, right? If we think about if that's the way we want to move forward. I don't know. I'm just, I'm really just throwing out some sort of options here because it's, it's clear that we need a path forward. And I think this committee and um, certainly I think CDD and the community is interested in at least charting a path forward um, in an intentional way rather than a defensive um, crouch and stance which is where we have been and I think we're all uncomfortable being there so um, I'm going to yield the floor at this time but I, I want you um, to just be on the record saying I think we should move forward with some zoning work out the kinks and details um, through the ordinance committee process as we usually do Otherwise, we're just going to have another development um, uh, zoning process in front of us that's put in front of us by the developers and not by the city council or, or CDD. So I'm going to yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, to everyone uh, for putting this together. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Mellon. I saw that Mr. Reardon has his hand up and then Councilor Carlon. Uh, it's Rob, through Madam Chair, Robert Reardon, a consultant to the city manager. Uh, I do want to say one of the things I've been tasked with is to find available open space if and talk to a number of different owners and properties. And again, the city is always on the lookout for it. But again, those opportunities are not very forthcoming. Uh, we did have the chance to purchase the uh, BBN site uh, earlier this year. Uh, so we are on the lookout. And if there was something available, we would certainly you know, investigate the possibility of being able to acquire it by the city. Thank you, Mr. Reardon. I believe there's a site we're going to call you, all of us, right after this meeting and encourage you to look at it, which, which Councillor Carlon referenced earlier. You may be able to give more details. Councillor Carlon? Your hand was up, but you are speaking without uh, unmuting yourself. I got excited. Thank you. Are we still pursuing the site that was drawn on the city's master plan? Mr. Reardon? Uh, we are always looking a bit for available sites and we're, we try to make as much as, we're making as many inroads as possible on a number of sites. I'm not trying uh, to be okay. too vague, but I just, you know. Okay, I got it, I got it. Negotiations, I got it. Um, I would hope on zoning that you, how many acres are in the whole Alewife Quadrangle ballpark? Melissa knows, ballpark. Oh, 
Okay, a lot. There are many acres. Um, so you're not going to study every part of the whole area to understand how each district is zoned, but I hope you look at one of your blocks and study it so that you're testing it and we can see what that zoning, new zoning would mean. Uh, Eric's drawing is a beautiful drawing, the drawing we saw earlier. I don't think it's directly related to the zoning. Uh, I could be wrong and you can tell me that, but uh, it looks like the max is six stories and we've already heard bigger plans than that. Um, so I, I, that's my last comment. I hope you at least take a look at one block, a typical block and say, this is what we feel we're aiming for. So we get a sense of that and that shouldn't take too long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Carlone. Um, I, I do have a couple of follow-up questions. I am really happy that all of my colleagues have asked really good, not just thoughtful comments and questions. And I hope that the city staff is getting a sense that, that they were really united with this idea that we are ready and stand poised to support you as you approach this next area of the city in a broad thinking way to bring it into, uh, into a, a, the part of the city with a range of uses that are knitted together in a more um, comprehensive fashion than is currently on the, on the table. And to remind us all, it's, it's really the entire area. I would say for myself, you asked the question about the um, alewife plan, as I've said many times, and I think you've heard pretty clearly here, I support many elements of it, but I do think, as Ms. Peter said, it is anticipated that there might be some public use, but it's really important that that be clear and that that be centered. I can um, fight it out with uh, Councillor McGovern about the need for school, because I think as we look at our anticipated population, it's pretty clear that we will need um, some of that infrastructure as well, but certainly community center or uh, fire station or uh, library and certainly the other element of it, which is the swath of land that includes green space and the flood resiliency plan. There's a pond in that for a reason, which is to ensure that this area of the city, just like on the other side of Alewife near uh, Jerry's Pond that's being developed, that it actually is built with the expectation that it is in a floodplain that used to be a swamp that needs desperately to ensure that we have the water retention infrastructure, not just huge um, uh, buckets basically underneath buildings, but that the infrastructure has it. So I, I hope if, if you want the message from me, I support the plan as long as it does include the, the attention to those public spaces. Um, because the climate mitigation is just as important as planning for a school, library, community center. I wondered, it, is there a, can any of you, as we think about this connectivity in many of the plans over the years, there has been a bridge, there's an underpass. Is there a better way than an underpass to connect that whole section on the um, east side of, of the parkway from Ringe Towers and Jefferson Park and that half of North Cambridge really closely to the Tobin Vassal Lane School, to the high school, to others, and, and um, basically knit those large green spaces together? Has that been talked about and addressed at all, or is it is is it just um, something that has started to be discussed? And for my colleagues who have not had a chance, I'm, I know Assistant City Manager Farouk has looked at it and Noah um, from Just to Start referenced it. And I know uh, Mr. Johnson from the Cambridge Housing Authority. There's actually a report on connectivity done for the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority specifically around range. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, um, that, that's where my um, thinking is coming from on this, that that clearly has gotten some attention lately. And I'm curious as to where we're at in that process. Thank you, Chair. So um, that work was um, was done principally starting from the um, Just to Start project on on Ringe Ave, on Ringe at Ringe Commons, uh, where they were looking. Um, it started off with that site and then expanded a little bit. Um, I can't say that anybody has gotten to the level of detail to to determine um, what is what would be a preferable approach, whether um, 
whether an underpass or a, an over bridge would be the better approach. I think that's the level of detail that um, would require a, a lot more um, sort of detailed detailed design to figure out what's workable. Because I think as we've talked about underpasses, I, you know, you've asked about the Yerksa underpass, you know, things like the access to the site are incredibly important. And there are, you know, at, at Yerksa, there was pre-existing because the road went all the way. It was, um, it, it created a an easier framework than exists, exists here because uh, all, all along is, um, is, is, you know, well, I shouldn't say privately owned, but it's, it's properties that are um, developed, affordable housing for the most part. Um, and so those are parcels that are being used that it's not public right of way. So it's a little bit more complicated to think of either of those those kinds of interventions because you're having them to rely on um, those projects to essentially provide access. Um, and that's, I'm, I'm, I'm close enough to affordable housing development and funding for it to, to know how incredibly challenging that can be to, to then think of trying to carve out part of the site for, um, for connectivity, not to say that that's not a uh, good and worthwhile goal um, from a broader perspective, but um, it's, it's also not straightforward in this instance, um, either of the two solutions. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And as I said, this is the be the not the beginning of the discussion, but as we heard earlier, the two um, students sent us a letter saying how wonderful it would be to connect, and not and then some. Of, we heard from some of uh, just to start, and I know that the the mayor had indicated to me earlier today that as she looked at that report, she thought it was was something we should be considering, and having grown up there, that it would be a nice connection to be made. It would, of course, only ever be made in conjunction with the residents and the owners to ensure that it was if. It was ever done it would have to be done obviously in a way that made people feel that it was a, a net benefit and um, something positive we just have a few minutes left um and councillor mcgovern has his hand up so i will go to him and then we can close out in a minute or two i just want to um you know we during the course of this meeting we did receive an email from mike johnston about the underpass and and uh specifically and about um some concerns that he has about that so i just want to make sure that he couldn't be here but i want to make sure people know that and and as we discuss this moving forward we're going to want to make sure we don't have any adverse effects on the development of affordable housing right yeah now he had indicated it he certainly wouldn't pay for it when i talked with him you know a month ago or and making sure that if we did anything it would have to fit in line with the existing uh, plans that they have they have reserved some uh, space for i think a, a multi-modal path along the railroad track so obviously this would all have to be worked out and yet now would be the time to do it when given the explosion of um interest in that area i uh, i think it the next steps are for um any of us to i think communicate with um cdd about about this plan and perhaps for the council as a whole, if, if you feel like director, uh, assistant city manager Fruit, that you need more specifics from us on what it is that we're endorsing, where I, I think we can provide that, whether it's through a policy order or something coming out of this committee, make sure that we know what you need um, because what we're hearing, I think back from you is, you need to know that we want this to happen and that we are endorsing the plan and that you might I also heard that there's definite interest in this, and yet there's some question about what the balance is really from, as we heard earlier, part of it is we don't, my understanding is we don't distinguish, we don't have a separate category in our zoning for labs, right? It's just light industrial or manufacturing or office, but that may be part of it, that, that do we want light industrial, which was a real push for the basis of entry level jobs as opposed to labs which sometimes don't have those entry level jobs but it sounds like you need a little more specificity from us around that balance but other than that you've heard loud and clear that you will be moving forward with some proposal for zoning with the caveat as Councillor McGovern said that while the city would have a little less leeway if we bring together all the zoning on the other hand we would control it in a way that would be quite helpful if we could move forward so I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Assistant City Manager Farouk. 
Um, no, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I think uh, it's always in, in this sort of scenario beneficial for us to um, to receive from the council a council order asking us to embark on translating this plan into zoning. That would be helpful. Okay. I, since we're supposed to end at four, I'm not sure we could whip it off right now, although I bet someone on this call Vice Mayor is so good at putting those together, but I think we'll work on it after this after this meeting. And um, it, it, it's certainly been a rich discussion and helped me understand, I think, how my colleagues think about it and also how the city thinks about it and the kinds of things that we need to move forward. I'm pretty excited because this is a plan that we've talked about a few times and now let's move forward and, and make it into reality because otherwise that, that area will, will move forward. It will be developed and the question is how much we can shape it. Um, with that, it's four o'clock. Uh, do we need a, a motion to adjourn or do we just automatically expire, Deputy Clerk? All right. No, we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. On the motion of Vice Mayor Mallon to adjourn, Councillor Nolan? Yes. Councillor Carlone? Yes. Vice Mayor Mallon? Yes. Councillor McGovern? Yes. Councilor Sondervan? Yes. 